we are in week five of, of walking in the Spirit, and we have been uh, looking at this one verse, and we, we start almost every one of these messages with that. Boy, I just got something on there that is... Uh, anyway, it, it says in Galatians 5.16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. And I keep bringing us back to that verse because I don't think there's any clear description in the Bible of, of what God wants us to do than that. And, and just how, how polar opposite allowing ourselves to be guided by our natural inclinations and how polar opposite that is as being guided by the Spirit of God. And so uh, I think we all learn by now that we need to figure out what this walking in the Spirit is, and that's what we're talking about. Uh, that's what we're going to start to look at a little more today. But today, before I do anything else, I want to do a little experiment. And, well, it's not an experiment. I want a little bit of feedback. Uh, whether your children are young right now or whether they are up and out of the house, I would like you to tell me one thing that you absolutely required them to do either on a daily basis or on a, on a, on a regular basis, something that you absolutely required your children to do as you were raising them. What? Check in, okay. What else? Harriet, or I'm sorry. Oh, whoever you are back there, I know who you are. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Tony. Brush your teeth. Anyone else? Go to church every week. Someone else. What did you require your children to do? What? Slow down. What else? Who said that? Study. Okay, there we go. What else? Help their parents. Help their parents. What else? Who said clean the room? Oh, you did. And what did you say? Okay. All right. So is that it? Is it what? Respect their elders, right? Is there anything else that we were... Mr. Kaiko? Put, how's that, how'd that work with you and your kids? <laughs> Someone else, something that you required your kids to do on a daily basis or on a regular and consistent basis. Address adults top. Okay, now, very good. Go ahead. You got one? Kiss the parents good night. Okay, very good. Okay, now, now let's go on the other side of the coin. Tell me something that you absolutely forbid them to do. Who said that? I did. Okay, don't do drugs. What else? Talk back. No, no. No, that's kind of like where we're going, right? Just, but things that you forbid them to do. Fight among each other. Disrespect. Lie. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Bad words. Steal. Anyone else? All righty. So what's, what's the point, Pastor? So here's, here's really what it all comes down to. All of these things that we want them to do and we don't want them to do, we have set standards for our kids because we love them, right? And we want to protect them from harm. Uh, we want them to have and live full and happy lives. And in that exact same way that we have had these standards for our children so that they can be safe 
and live full and happy lives in the same way God gives us instruction to protect us from harm and so that we will have full and happy lives. And so uh, these next verses, we're going to go now into the book of Colossians. And uh, as I mentioned last week, there is, uh, there's not too many scripture verses that I know that give us more practical instruction than these. So if you have a Bible, open it up to Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to start in the first verse, and then uh, we're also going to have it on the screen for you. And what we're going to do in, these, for, in, our, in our message today is we're going to look at what I consider to be a prelude to the practical instruction, but it's good ground for us to build our foundation of learning how to walk in the Spirit in. And uh, again, it's some of the clearest instruction I know that the Bible gives. So we're going to go verse by verse and comment as we go. And our first verse is simply this, Colossians 3.1. It says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And I think the very first thing that we need to learn is when it comes to walking in the Spirit, the first and most important thing is to learn to watch where you're walking. Watch where you're walking. I think it's the most fundamental step of learning how to walk in the Spirit is to look and see where it is that you're going. Because for a Christ follower, life on earth is not our destination. This is simply our starting point. We can focus on what's around us, but, but it's where we're going that the real prize is. And, you know, when, when Becky and I travel somewhere on vacation, we, we see the countryside. We'll, we'll pull over and we'll stop for a brief visit here or to check something out there. But always on vacation, the goal is to get where you're going, right? So we don't linger too long in any one spot because we have our mind set on something else. We have our mind getting to that one place. And where is the Christian going? Well, we are going home. We are going to our heavenly home. Just, just like at the end of a long day of work, uh, you just, you just want to go home, right? And, and our life on earth is truly like just that long day at work, and our spirits inside of us long to go to our heavenly home. Well, what's heavenly home going to be like, Pastor? What's it going to be like? Well, I can tell you this. It's going to be better than here. That's the one thing I know for a fact. It'll be better than here. And I, I, I like work. I find work satisfying. I even find it fun at times, but I also can find work to be hard and tedious and upsetting and and exhausting. And as much as I like going to work, I like going home better, right? And, And what do I do when I get home? I probably do the same thing as you. Well, we sit down and we rest. And I want you to look at that verse again, that Colossians 3, 1. Bring it back up for me, Carly. And in that Colossians 3, 1, I want you to see what Jesus is doing there. He's home, he's finished his work on the cross, and he is waiting for us to come home and to rest with him. John 14, verses 2 and 3, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. It says, Jesus is speaking, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't true, I'd tell you, so that where I am, you are also. So, When we're going to learn how to walk in the Spirit, the first thing we need to do is to look up and see the destination that we're going. We're going home, and Jesus is there waiting for us. Look at this next verse, Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Now, you see that phrase, set your mind? That is the expression the Bible uses to tell us to focus to concentrate, to, to draw our energies towards. Uh, it's the expression the Bible uses to tell us to prioritize and to decide the direction that we're going to be traveling in life. Remember what our goal here is. Our goal is to get home. And we're learning how to walk in the Spirit rather than in the flesh. We already know how to walk in the flesh. We've been practicing it our entire lives. But this walking in the Spirit stuff, well, this is different. And, and, and we need some simple instruction on how to get it started. And so it tells us the first thing that we need to do is to set our mind. We, make it, we need to make a decision to do so. We need to decide for ourselves that God's way of walking through life is better than ours. Now, unfortunately, I usually don't think that way. 
Usually if there's my way and God's way, I'll try my way first, which will usually go, right? And then I have to decide what I'm going to do. I'm either going to stubbornly keep going in the wrong direction, or I'm going to say, well, maybe I should have done what the Bible told me to do there. Maybe I shouldn't have yelled back. Maybe I should have been forgiving. Maybe I should have been more patient or gracious. But typically I try my way, which goes, and then I realize I should do God's way right? And so this setting our mind is making this decision that walking through life his way is better than ours. We set our minds on our heavenly objective, but we're still on the earth, right? Uh, We're still on the earth. We still got to deal with earth issues, right? We got to pay our bills. We got to cut our grass. We still got to deal with traffic on the parkway. We can't become so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Uh, But when we set our minds on the things above where Christ is, what really is happening is we are opening ourselves to dealing with life's problems and issues from a biblical perspective. That's really what's happening. We're changing the perspective on how we're going to handle life. We follow the directives and the examples that the Bible gives us on how to handle burdens, difficulties, hardships, even joys. And and Jesus is the example that we follow. The Bible makes that so clear to us. Look at this verse, 1 Peter 2, 21. You have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow his steps. Look, if you want to know how to handle life, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus, because he has walked through life. He has suffered as we suffer. He has struggled as we have struggled. He has encountered all the same temptations and all the same problems, and he went through, should I say, unscathed? until he gave his life for us, right? And he is the example. And it says right there, look, follow his steps. What does that mean? That we're going to be walking, right? We're going to be walking. And that's what we're supposed to do, this walking in the Spirit. We're following the steps of our Master. Let's go on to the next verse. It's Colossians 3.3. And this is a strange verse. It says, you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You have died, and your life is hidden in Christ with God. Well, what what does that mean, right? I find this confusing because I I don't think I'm dead yet. I, you know, I, 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 I can pinch myself, it hurts. I feel very much alive. So what does this mean that I have died and my life is hidden in Christ? Well, this is talking about the spirits inside of us. But it says that I'm dead. So what part of me is dead? Is there something dead? And actually, there is. First off, our physical bodies carry the sentence of death in them. Uh, Sin has corrupted beyond repair these wonderfully complex machines called our bodies. And they are going to run for so long, and then they're going to cease to run. That's it. Uh, But in the same time, if you're a Christian, even though this body is essentially already dead, even though this body is essentially already dead, inside of me there is an eternal spirit that is alive and well because Christ has revived and rejuvenated and given me new life. Here's how we know that. It's Romans 8.10. Look at what it says. It says, if Christ is in you, though your body is dead because of sin, Yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. So you see, there is a part of me that is already dead. Yes, I'm still walking around. I'm not a zombie, sort of, right? I'm still walking around, but it's written. You know, it's like written on the wall. One day, this body's going to end, but I am hidden in Christ, and my spirit is alive in Christ. But this verse is also referring to how we should be living, because we are to be dying to sinful practices and living for God. I like what uh, Matthew Henry said about this verse. He says, just as heaven and earth are contrary to one another, both cannot be followed together. An affection to one will weaken and abate the affection to the other. Those that are born again are dead to sin because its dominion is broken, its power gradually subdued by the operation of grace. I like that. So, you know, it's, it's either going to be alive or dead, 
But when Christ is in me, the power of sin is broken. Yeah, I still sin, but that power of sin is broken within me. And God is slowly going to work His grace in my life till I sin less and become more like Him. You know, I, I heard this movie reference once. Maybe you did it too. Learning how to walk in the Spirit can be likened to this movie reference. Wef- Wef- movie reference, right? And, uh, and it was a reference of two wolves. And it said something like this. It said, inside each man lives two wolves. Have you heard this? Each, inside each man lives two wolves. And, and, uh, and whichever wolf gets fed the most grows strongest until eventually it destroys the other. Inside of each of us are two wolves. We feed one and not the other. Whichever one gets fed gets stronger. So which wolf are you feeding? Which wolf are you feeding? Are you feeding this new spiritual person inside of you who seeks to follow the paths of heaven? Or are you feeding the person inside of you who follows after the paths of earth? Maybe you think that by following God wholeheartedly, you give up your individuality, uh, that you become some kind of mindless robot, an extremist, a a brainwashed cult follower. But I don't think there's really anything that is further from the truth than that, because learning to walk in the Spirit teaches us just how much power God has given us to live lives that are personally fulfilling. Do you remember what we said a time again through this lesson? Remember what the Apostle Paul said? He said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Well, walking in the Spirit sets us free from the bondage and slavery of sin that controls and robs and destroys our lives right here, right now. That bondage of sin destroys us right here, right now. And when we learn to walk in the Spirit, or as we learn to walk in the Spirit, you don't lose who you are. You become the person that God created you to be in the first place. It's, it's, more, it's more than a new version of yourself. It's not reinventing who you are. It's, it's, it's the dying of those things that need to die inside of us and a rebirth into a new life. And here's how I know that. This verse right here, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Look at it for yourself. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, right? The old things passed away. Behold, new things come. And so as we learn to walk in the Spirit, at the end of it all, that new creature in Christ, you're not lost. You are transformed. You are made different. Colossians 3, 4 gives us this next verse. When Christ, who is, when are we transformed? When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Do you remember last week we were talking about that caterpillar to butterfly thing, right? And the work that God does in our lives happens on the inside, and it becomes displayed on the outside of us. But, but we make a choice to walk in his direction or not. We make that choice. And so, really, there it is. Uh, Learning how to walk in the Spirit is, A, we have to make a choice. We have to see where we want to go, and we have to make a choice to do so. There it is, the promise given to men by God that for those who will follow Him by walking in the Spirit, He will take the things in our lives that are broken and lost and dead, and He will transform them into something new and alive. And the only example I can think of off the top of my head is the years that I spent in addiction. And I know I've used that example a lot, but for all of the destruction addiction brought into my life, when I became a Christian and I started to learn how to follow follow God and walk in the Spirit. He took all of that pain, and now he is able to use my experiences and what I've learned to help other people. That's what God does. He'll take the dead, and he will use it to bring life. And that's the way God does things, right? For the Christian, there's nothing that you go through that God will not turn and use for good. But that's only for the Christians. If you're not a Christian, it does not apply. And so uh, the next verses, what I'd like to do is just read a few of these next verses. We're going to wrap up, and that's kind of the prelude of what we're talking about uh, in the weeks ahead of walking in the Spirit where we get some very practical instruction. So let's just take a little peek, and then we'll do communion. Starting in Colossians 3, 5, we get these practical instructions. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body 
as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. We're going to talk about that next week. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Verse 8. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Verse 11, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all, which means what God has for us is available to anyone that wants it. That's an amazing thing. We're going to look at all those verses in more detail next week and even some after that. But uh, that's where I think is the right place to stop today. We're going to have communion. Uh, Tony, I'm going to put you to work again, please. And, and, And Lindsay, would you mind helping with communion as well?